All right, folks, it is the bewitching hour, so. Uh, call the meeting to order and ask for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Motion carries. Work session two, follow up. Jeff? Good evening, Mayor, and good evening, Commissioners. Tonight we will have a follow up to your last work session. We'll go over in detail the uh, street and signal projects in your capital improvement plan. We'll also preview what you will see at your August work session in the Parks and Recreation Master Plan with some early implementation projects in the Capital Improvement Plan. We'll start a conversation tonight on the market study that will continue on into the fiscal year that we're about to enter into. And we'll offer an opportunity for anyone who is present or who has submitted a comment for public input. And then as we do with all work sessions, if there's any questions or comments or requests from the commissioners for us to either answer tonight or to follow up and answer at the next meeting. So with that, we've got some follow up to some items that came up in work session number two and I'll recognize Bobby Fitz. All right, uh, good evening. As Joe mentioned, there were, uh, you'll recall last week, there were a few questions on the fund balance presentation that um, I'm going, going to try to answer, hopefully, uh, tonight for you. Uh, one of the first ones was how much fund balance was appropriated um, in this budget, and then how much, any, how much of any of that was uh, directed toward operating expenditures. Uh, so I have a, t a breakdown here of the total about 2.5 million is the grand total that includes uh, capital reserves of about 800 excuse me 998,000 which includes um, stormwater transportation impact fees power bill and uh, greenways uh, bicycle and pedestrian reserves uh, 1,490,000 that was unassigned directed towards capital and then the 30,000 that I mentioned uh, is unassigned towards uh, operating. That's kind of a trial community center uh, landscape and contract services we're uh, looking to enter into. Uh, the next question was how much fund balance are we projected to spend? Uh, what would our percentages be uh, after that? So it, uh, the projections are for June 30, 21 for this year. Uh, it will be about 73%. That's uh, June 30, 21 numbers based on 22 uh, projected budget. Then uh, projecting out a little further to June 30, 22, uh, this is all, if all that appropriated fund balance was spent in 22, that would put the percentage at about 59% roughly. Let me just make sure I'm understanding correctly, Bobby. So, 73% of the fund balance is what we're projecting to spend? No, that would be the fund balance percentage at June 30, 21. Okay. So that's fund okay, balance okay. total basically divided by 22 budget amount. Gotcha. And so then with what we spend, it will be down to 59%. If we were to spend all the, the 2.5 million. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's, that's Thank you. Uh, then the, the third question that was asked was, um, what are the median percentages for smaller municipalities? Uh, I wasn't sure if Mi uh, Moody's had that breakdown, checked with them, and they, it was readily available. Uh, and you'll see there in front of you, um, I highlighted the, the line that applies to uh, the, fund, the, the metric we were talking about, and uh, then it's broken down by rating. Uh, you'll see we're, we're AA3. So for the median for the double A's, it's about 43.3%. Uh, percent. Most of them around 43 to, to 47. Uh, even the triple A is 47 and a half. And uh, a reminder, we're 89.5. This is our bond rating? No. This is the fund balance as a percentage of operating revenue so metric the, in the bond rating. The, the AA double A. 
Right. We're double A three. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the triple A, the median was forty seven point five and double uh, A is forty three point three. Um, I think overall it was 30, this for all cities, it was 38.5, I believe it was. <clears throat> and that's really all I had. If anybody else has any follow-up questions to those answers, I'll be glad to try and answer them. No, I thank you. That's good information. Good. Okay. All right. Um, good evening, Mayor, members of the board. Um, tonight, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about um, something I think is a little more attractive than stormwater we talked several weeks ago. Um, it, the picture that I got up there is a um, picture of, of the 2011 East Barbie Street cul-de-sac. Uh, several of you may remember there was a project that was initiated by Commissioner Collins and was a uh, town funded project. I will tell you my personal opinion that streets and traffic signals and transportation in a whole was probably going to be one of our biggest challenges over the next five to ten years. So, and this CIP, we are making a good stab at trying to get ahead of some of those, those needs. All right, just a few facts as we get started about our street system. Um, typical useful life for our streets is 15 to 20 years. Um, that depends on the roadway construction. If you if around 15 years, you're going to have a, a road construction of 8 inch uh, CABC stone and 2 inches of asphalt. 2011, with the adoption of street and storm drainage specifications, we've changed that to 8 and 3 for local streets and residential collectors, so 8 and 4. So that, those streets that are our newer streets are going to are more than likely see the 20 year useful life. Uh, it's currently at this year end, we're projecting to have 28.7 miles of street. Um, that's basically if we were to divide that by 20 years useful life, we need to pay 1.4 miles a street annually. And based on last year's bids, um, it is, to accomplish that task, we need approximately $220,000 annually. Um, one of the things, as you well know, you and we've talked about is the significant growth we've seen in streets over the last several years and since 2015, uh, we've had a 50% increase in streets. All right, let's talk about street health a little bit. Overall, our condition average and what we wanna talk about PCR is our uh, pavement condition rating. Our pavement condition rating overall is a 92.3, which is good. That's a very good uh, rating. That's probably skewed a little bit um, because of a lot of the new streets we've added over the last five years. But overall, we're doing well in our streets. Um, um, regarding poor streets, last year we had 8%. Our paving project uh, that we did last year dropped us from 8 to 4%. And our goal next year, if approved in the budget, is to, uh, to pay the remaining streets that are listed below that are poor. And that should wipe out completely the poor streets and, uh, that we have in our system. So next year, if this portion of the budget pay, we're looking to pay East Van Street, Yates Place, Wellington, and Southland Drive. And uh, each one of those have a PCR of 70 or less, which is poor. Um, something you may be seeing is we started this in 2016, a paving condition study and all, and through that process, we talked about street health in regards to a pavement curve. And we also try to pay it to something that we deal with every day. So we try to tie it back to car health. And so basically you see there a street that we accept in from dedication from Weaver's Ponds or Barrington or Autumn Lakes is going to come in with a condition close to the score, close to 100, which puts it at excellent. So in reference to that, you see a car, a 1957 Chevy, if I believe correctly, uh, that is in an excellent condition. As we go further along the pavement curve, as the time goes out, the condition worsens. And here I just basically showed a car in the fair uh, condition. It scores about an 80. Something to remember on our paving schedules uh, is excellent is 95, good is 90, fair is 80, um, moderate is 70, and less than 70 is poor. 
Uh, here's just the one in the poor condition here showing you we have a PCR about 60. One of the things in our, in our pavement management that we started in 2016 is looking at the pavement condition in relation to cost. Um, as you can see there going down, the blue is excellent, the green is good, kind of like we saw previously, and the red is poor. The main thing I want to show here, this data is a little bit old, but the, the main thing is we want to gather, as the farther we go through the pavement life cycle, the cost can go from three times to four times. So if you take something that is in fair condition and do some pavement techniques, we can stretch that useful life. But if we wait until it gets down into the poor, we have to work on the, the sub-base and, and reconditioning of that sub-base so the cost can, you know, like I say, triple or quadruple in, in cost. So we want to try to stay ahead of that pavement curve before it, it drops off and we spend significantly more. All right. Um, several things about our upcoming projects and stuff. Talk about the timeline a little bit. This is our Shepherd School uh, roadway project and traffic signal project. Uh, this is the project that is in design now with WSP. We are uh, in between the 30 and the 60 percent uh, design phase. Um, we are expecting design and right of way drawings uh, late this summer uh, to be coming in. Um, we are requesting $350,000 in this year's budgets to move us through the next phase of construction and design. Um, we're, uh, one thing I do want to share with you, roadway projects take typically three to five years. One of the things that drags that out is, especially with this one, it being an NCDOT road, it is going to be dedicating and giving to the NCDOT. Each time we reach a milestone phase of 30, 60, 90, and 100 percent, we have to go through an NCDOT review process. Um, that process is now starting to creep back up with all the growth that we've seen in this area. Review process now is taking up to six weeks. Is there now more review time? So something like this where we have four reviews, we can spend 24 weeks just in review process with NCDOT. And that's not if we got to go back and correct something. That's if each one of them gets approved initially uh, for that phase as we go through them. So um, they do take long. Um, I know people that like to see these things uh, constructed a lot faster. I would would too, but this is the process. So we wanted to let you know that basically uh, we look from the spring of 22 next year to have a 100% plan approval and have substantial complete that that winter. Um, in the, you know in our request for funds this year, I do want to just keep in your back of your mind. We are currently working with Barrington, and this week we reached out to Autumn Lakes to start talking to them about their fee and loop process. Um, Barrington has a requirement to contribute to this project at the 500 CO, and Autumn Lakes has it at the 300 CO process. The other project we have going on right now is uh, for roadway improvements and signals is the green pace and the rental project. Um, we're also in about the same phases of we are on Shepherd School Road. We're in the 30%. Uh, we should be coming uh, later this fall, um, about the 65%. One of the things we originally started out with is the design you see here left to the red lines. Um, we did come back this year, and the manager is recommending that we add additional scope to this, uh, about approximately 250 feet. And the goal of that is with the development of the Popeyes that is coming on place, um, that we can tie some of these roadway improvements. So we're asking for the next phase of funding. We're asking for about forty to fifty thousand dollars for the expanded scope to, to do that tie-in. We think it's appropriate to do it at this phase. Um, What's the yep, so no. it's forty to fifty, but the it says the request is one hundred and fifty. Yes, but well, basically it's one hundred fifty. Forty to fifty is the, the number that we're using for the expanded for the expanded scope. The 110 is for the next phase of the construction project. Uh, no. We have some initial okay. funding, and what we've done is been appropriating funding in phases as we go through the construction project. So similar to um, Shepherd School Road, we asked for initial funding. The following year, we asked for additional funding to get us to the additional phases of the project. So 150 is the total that you're going to need but you're only asking for 40 this year no we're it? asking for 150 in the budget this year well, i'm confused about it then <laughs> it's, it's, we're asking for 150 and that's what matches the manager's request i just wanted to tell you if you read my my report it was originally 110 the manager asked to add additional scope to the project 
and so that's approximately 40,000. So we wanted to be clear with you, the original quest is 110, the expanded scope that you see there in the red is 40,000 for a total of 150,000 bucks. Okay, does that carry through substantial completion? Yes, sir, that, this does carry through, this estimate does carry through Then why do you need it all this year? I uh, know. If some of it's gonna be done, well, no, that's right. Twenty fall twenty twenty two would be in this fiscal year. Sorry, I'm, getting, right. my, I'm hey. getting myself confused here. Yeah, uh, these, okay. these dates and stuff, times get away from me very quickly. So don't no apologize. I'm, I'm sorry. So yeah. How much is Popeyes um, being included? How much are they going to pay? They're they're winding uh, uh, the the portion of the property and, and with all the development along with this corridor um, that's coming in for development, they widen. To the property lines of each of their development and 50% of it and all. So basically in front of Popeyes you'll get basically 50% of the right of way widened from that length. Um, we don't know what that cost is? Uh, for the Popeyes uh, piece to be widened? I'll have to get back to you. I think I do have it at the office sir but I do not remember what it is off the top of my head. Okay. We, the reason I do think we have it is we talked to them about a possibility of fee and and I can give you that answer. Right. Next meeting, I will make sure I bring that back to you. I apologize, I don't know that off the top of my head. All right. Any other questions? Good questions. And none. Um, let's go back a little bit. Let me just hit on this a little bit. Just some of the things you know we're doing today is uh, DOT, when we started the Green Pace and the Rental one, asked us to look at a little bit of an impact study that included. Um, Riley Hill Road and Proctor, we completed that. Um, we've got contracts with the uh, design firm, we've done surveying, we've got our NCDOT contract that, that this group approved and we've completed 25% plans and we're soon to be approaching 60. And we've been working in coordination with Popeyes to make sure we tie the limits of construction together so we don't overlap. Next project we want to talk about is that we requested in this year's budget is LED lighting. We're calling this conversion is phase two. Uh, several years back, uh, we did complete one phase of that. Um, in that phase, we, we converted from high pressure sodium lights to LED. Um, we did not complete all of it. We left about 200 um, uh, light poles in, in theory that were left out. They were actually on another building. It was an oversight. And so we want to come back now and convert the remaining items that are uh, outstanding, uh, approximately, like I say, 200 poles. Uh, majority of them are in We Respond Phase 1, Braemar, um, and then we got a few other hot spots. And so basically the conversion cost is $50 per pole, 200 uh, poles times 50 is 10,000 bucks. The payback on that is two and a half years. And that will convert us to all our lights to be an LED on the street. And then, uh, of course, as we add them new in each subdivision, now they're LED. So, um, are these going to be zero bleed, or this is just? They will just be changing the lamp in the existing fixture. Okay. And also, my apologies. This is different from the um, LED proposal for downtown. That is correct. Yes, sir. Those downtown are changing the fixture type um, and going to a different wattage, but they're, they're basically all be going to LED. And, uh, Yes, sir, but they are separate projects. Okay. Um, the next item we'd like to talk to you a little bit about is um, Jones Street connector. Uh, what we are recommending is to pulling the Jones Street connector piece behind Hillbillies and behind the proposed cookout out of the North Rendell Avenue project. Um, the drawings are, engineering drawings are complete. It is a town right away, so we have full control over it. The um, reason we're wanting to do that is uh, we've talked to you a little bit, and I know Joe's talked to you during your monthly meetings about some of our right-of-way acquisition issues and the uh, cost, uh, unexpected costs that we're seeing. We have also want to take advantage of, potentially take advantage of, a real redevelopment opportunity at Parish Realty and making that a four-way stop there at Pierce's <coughs> Road. Um, so we also feel like by moving forward with this project, we can make some safe movements to the stoplight immediately and ease some of the pressure that we're seeing on Rendell Avenue. Um, and we also have an opportunity for a reimbursement from Cookout for in fee and loot. Um, you know, I, I, we, I think the, in a later date, we'll bring you back some revisions for North Rendell Avenue, but we'll be working on a work session for you. But we feel like this is an appropriate project to pull out of that project and get ahead of to try to ease some of the traffic congestion there. 
We feel like it also lower the cost because we do not have to necessarily meet NCDOT standards and grant standards, um, and we can make an immediate improvement in the area. So we're requesting $345,000 to complete this work this year. What's the cookout fee in lieu going to be? Um, the proportional estimate for um, cookout is approximately $285,000. Now that's left to be negotiated. I can't guarantee we're gonna get all of it, but that's the estimate that we're starting with. Okay, thank you. No problem. And that wraps up our presentation and clearly, hopefully we never get to see this image here uh, where we're stuck in the mud, stuck in the road, but um, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. I'll be sure that I'm reading this right, that we have 347,000 power bill does that sound about right to you? Say, say that again, sir. 347,000 pal bill. In fund balance? No, pal what I'm bill. showing here is uh, total revenues, 21-22, pal bill, 347,000. I didn't work on the revenue side. I'm going to let Bobby or the manager speak to that. I've worked on the expenditure side. I, I'm going to say it's right, but I have well, not looked at that side that, enough that to leads to my question. How much money total do we have in pal bill? Mm -hmm. Mayor, um, what what page are you on, B2? I'm on B2. Okay. Thank you. You said E2, right? B2 is where I am. And it just says power bill appropriation. Okay, uh, the appropriation is 347,000. Revenues, I don't see. What that is is um, current year, or the 22 amount for power bill is about 127,000, and then we're pulling 220 from uh, reserves, basically, power bill reserves. So that, that gives you the 347 total. Okay, but it is power bill reserves. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Could you, right, could you say it one it. more time, Bobby, so I can write that down? All right, so the current year power bill revenues that we would get and are uh, proposing to use is about 127000 Okay. And then uh, 220000 of power bill reserves is we're uh, proposing to use. Okay. For the total of the 347. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none? Good. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor and members of the board. Um, thank you for having me back again tonight. Um, we are going to talk about uh, the recommended CIP for uh, Parks and Recreation. Uh, so what is new this year and I'm thankful uh, for is that uh, the Parks and Rec uh, related projects are being pulled out of the standard property management project. So in the past, you would have seen a Parks and Rec project for, say, a playground or a picnic shelter would have been lumped in there uh, in the property management um, CIP listing uh, with, say, air handlers or um, police department renovations, things like that. So uh, this will allow us to have uh, more transparency uh, in what it takes to operate the Parks and Rec department, but it also shows um, that we're committed to the Parks and Rec master plan process uh, that we have moving forward. Uh, it is something that as we work with our grant agencies um, that they appreciate being able to see. So uh, as with 
Uh, all projects that we bring before you, we try to take a look at the Zebulon um, 2030 strategic plan and figure out how um, we can implement that best and how uh, projects uh, within our realm will fit that. So uh, for Parks and Rec specifically, uh, for the upcoming budget year, things we looked at uh, fall underneath all three of our strategic goals. And so uh, for Vibrant Downtown, um, as with you saw uh, in our economic development, uh, activating and connecting alleys, where that does have that connectivity and walkable piece, but absolutely has a recreation and cultural perspective to it. Um, also developing events, entertainment, and cultural attractions to draw people not just downtown, but um, throughout our community, but that's how we fit into vibrant downtown as well. Um, small town life, improving walkability, that's not just sidewalks, that's also your greenways um, and our park system. Uh, promoting uh, more community events and festivals, that's something that uh, stood out very strongly in your strategic plan, as well as enhancing and creating more community gathering spaces. Growing smart, uh, we've talked quite a bit about implementing wayfinding and branding. You'll see a little bit more about that in this presentation tonight. Uh, planning for appropriate land use. Um, so where are we going to put parks? Where are they most appropriate? Um, and how do we work with different developments that are coming to town? Uh, pursuing economic development opportunities. We had a wonderful um, chat with Wake County's Parks and Rec Director and um, Commissioner uh, Sick Hutchinson with the mayor uh, today, and that was one thing we talked about is the role of parks, uh, recreation, greenways, uh, what their impact on the economy and bringing people to our communities and keeping them here. Uh, so that we absolutely have a role in that, as well as maintaining appropriate staffing. So our 2022 highlights, um, most importantly, as we mentioned uh, several times, is that we're uh, looking to adopt and implement your first Parks and Rec Master Plan. Uh, and we are going to create and adopt a Parks and Recreation CIP. Uh, what we're going to focus on right now, just because we don't have the full plan developed, but we did take a look at kind of where we were so far in the community feedback. Um, with the visioning um, exercises, as well as the implementation workshops we did with the Parks Market Advisory Board. Uh, so we tried to give our best uh, projection. Uh, if you took a look at the Parks and Rec um, memo, um, but one of the things we really wanted to focus on is things that might be a maintenance issue or maybe a safety issue, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but also some low-hanging fruit opportunities. So our community really came out and supported this master plan and participated in it. And so figuring out ways to phase in projects and do a little bit across the spectrum that lots of people in our community can start to see movement. So um, we're offering this low hanging fruit opportunity so that we can work together as we adopt this master plan to figure out what those priority projects where we can do a little bit here and there uh, to, for our community to see this project moving forward. Um, so I'm not going to go in complete detail with our Parks and Rec Master Plan, but I did want to just highlight the different levels. So um, you've heard us talk about we did a system inventory and analysis where they took a look at each of our parks and uh, all the plans around us and how we compare to other um, communities and uh, as well as taking a look at our operating, our staffing levels, our needs as far as programming. Um, we did a very heavy community engagement uh, process. Uh, we've recently done a vision development, and so what's here on the right um, is something that you can see uh, on public input now. Uh, so if you go to uh, the town's webpage and you look under the Parks and Recreation Department, there's a tab that says Community Engagement. And on that tab, you can scroll down once you click on it, and you can find this visioning um, feedback that we did a couple of weeks ago, but there's a wonderful video that our consultant put together that kind of describes the process uh, in brief for you, so you're welcome to take a look at that, and it talks about how we developed our vision uh, with our advisory board. And so we're at the recommendation and implementation stage, so we're wrapping things up, figuring out the final cost of projects and how we're going to fund them or how we could fund them. Uh, so we're, we're kind of in that phase now. Uh, so just wanted to share uh, the vision uh, that was put together um, through our workshop is to create recreational and cultural opportunities 
that enhance quality of life, connect our residents through positive impacts on health and wellness, social interaction, economic growth, and environmental stewardship. So we're breaking our, syst our Parks and Rec uh, system into um, five subsystems. And so you'll have your um, neighborhoods, uh, parks and open spaces. Uh, you also have community parks and athletic facilities, connectivity and access, natural areas and sustainability, and you also have um, your programs uh, and cultural and health activities. So uh, just to kind of get us just some ideas of what is gonna come out of uh, your master plan and what's being proposed and that you'll talk more about in um, the next uh, couple of months is this uh, proposal in the neighborhood parks and open spaces. So this is just an opportunity that you may find before you. Um, you've seen this before. Um, this is your downtown. We talked about your alley network. Uh, what you'll also see is down here on the bottom. Uh, this is your uh, current fire station. Uh, just to the right of it is where the EMS building currently is. So what you're seeing there uh, is a downtown park uh, with the possibility of an amphitheater or whatever we develop that as, but right now it's just, we're just for representation purposes showing it as an amphitheater. Um, and you're also seeing how it's a, it's a very zoomed in view of how it could connect uh, that spine greenway that we've talked about from Little River Park uh, to Five County Stadium uh, coming through downtown utilizing our sidewalks and alley network. Uh, community parks and athletic facilities. You have a wonderful facility at Community Park. It has, um, it, it's used, it's uh, well, very well used. Um, it does a lot for us on a programming uh, perspective right now. As we grow, you're going to need um, additional facilities. Um, another thing that if you want to offer tournament opportunities, for us to be really considered for a tournament, you need to have at least four fields uh, in a center location. So they don't want you to have four fields in a town, but then they have to travel all around town. So they want them cent centralized. Um, we're proposing what you'll see is a phased approach to this where we renovate uh, what we own first. Uh, and then if there's opportunity to expand the park, these are just some parcels that were um, identified, but I mean, there are others that we could work with potentially, um, but this is what could happen one day. So how community park could expand uh, eventually. So it's just purely a concept. Uh, natural areas and sustainability. So this is an opportunity for uh, Little River Park. Uh, that you uh, will see in a couple of months and we'll be able to talk a little bit more about. So um, the goal uh, with Little River Park is to keep it very passive, uh, keep it as, nat as natural as we possibly can, um, create opportunities to um, celebrate environmental education, uh, to create opportunities to um, recognize uh, the history uh, of uh, that location as well as create just that um, eventual trail hub uh, and to spearhead what we hope to activate at the reservoir property eventually. So you're probably aware there's 3,000 acres uh, just a little bit north of Little River Park. Uh, the town's board, in addition to Wendell's board, has adopted the Little River Park corridor. Uh, so if you continue to go down uh, Little River, we also have Tarpley's Mill Pond, but what we could do with Little River Park is something that could very much complement and hopefully spark additional conversation because uh, activating that property could do a lot for us regionally um, for recreation purposes, but also um, economically for our community. Uh, and I won't go but in so much detail, but this is uh, for your connectivity and access. This is an example. Considering our sidewalks where they need to be to get to your parks, um, is it easy to maneuver between neighborhoods and communities and get to services and get to your parks, uh, as well as your greenway uh, connectivity? Uh, I'm going to skip over the programming piece because that's more operational than CIP. Uh, for fiscal year 22, um, I'm going to jump in now to the specific projects that we highlighted. 
uh, for Gill Street Park. Um, if you have spent any time at Gill Street Park and you went and stood on the basketball court and looked around, you would find that you're in a bowl. Um, so the land around the basketball court, it, the elevation is higher. So what's happening is it's cra it, the water is getting underneath um, our basketball court. It's shifting um, the uh, surfacing, and so we've had um, some consultants come out and take a look with us, and their recommendation is that we come in and address the drainage issue, build up the basketball court, and build a new court. Uh, so the estimate that we were provided was um, about $50,000, and we're also recommending dispersed picnic areas. Um, this is something that is popping up a little bit more often in parks now. Uh, I think if you've done any traveling, this is the easiest way for me to tell you what a dispersed seating uh, or picnic area would be. So if you've been to a rest stop where you see a variety of uh, smaller picnic shelters with just one or two picnic tables underneath it. And the purpose for that is because this park is that it's almost in between that pocket park and that neighborhood park. Um, so it's intended really to serve the residents that are walking there, um, that live around there. That doesn't mean that others aren't welcome there and might not use it, but its intended use is more for that family-based, um, immediate resident base. And so spreading out some picnic areas for them and seating would just do a lot for that park. Can you tell me, how many projected dispersed picnic placement areas yeah. that $50,000 will cover? Yeah, so we're looking at should do about three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now granted, construction prices have gone nuts. So <laughs> um, I say that and I hope that's what we can get and that things settle down. Um, so the next piece is Little River Park. Uh, so you're familiar, we've been working through um, the FEMA process and uh, that doesn't just move very fast for us, but we uh, are working through the next phase of how we can move forward with FEMA funding. And so the next phase for us would be um, to do a phase two archeological study uh, with SHPO. So that is uh, $30,000. Uh, there is, um, opportunity we should um, be reimbursed uh, for expenses related with FEMA. We're also, uh, if you've spent time at Little River Park, uh, any time in recent years, if you've taken a walk down that path on, if you parked on the water plant roadside of Little River Park and you walked up that path past the dam and took a right, you'd come across, which is about eight acres, between eight and nine acres of kudzu. Um, and it, is ha it has so much potential um, to be a lot of things. Uh, one, uh, we can do that long range planning where uh, we develop that into something really nice with your education center and some other things. Uh, but we can also in the short term uh, start eradicating that kudzu and then just start doing some very basic things with some wildflowers just to um, start taking control over that property, um, get it usable for our community right now with not eight to nine acres of kudzu. It's not very usable for us. Um, and it also, in the dormant season, is a fire hazard. Um, so there are a variety of options for eradicating that kudzu. Um, Goats. <laughs> that is one. Uh, so we worked with the forestry service. Uh, we had them come out and partner with us and they did an urban forestry plan. And so they gave us um, a couple of options to take a look at, uh, but in consultation with them, they highly recommend uh, that we treat it um, with an herbicide and uh, that that would, because it's just so overwhelming there and uh, they felt even if we put goats out there, it's really truly going to take about four years for goats to handle it, and you're still going to have to end up coming back and treating it, treating it with uh, chemicals. So um, our recommendation is to let's start working on getting that kudzu gone. Uh, then we know that there's probably going to be some groundwork issues. Um, there's probably some holes from many years of different uses, and so we just want to get it to where it's a safe place, and if there's some opportunity for us to put it in use on the short term, we would like to do that. Can you get me the um, 
name of the herbicide that the Forestry Service recommended be used? Sure. They didn't give us a specific one. They just gave us a pressure of different ones that they would recommend. Okay. Can, can then can you get me that the sure. classes? Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh, did you say that the plan would be to come back every four to five years? For what? On the cutthroat. For the kudzu, well, the hope is that once you, we, we want to be very aggressive with it in the first year and just eradicate it in the first year. We're always going, now that kudzu, if you are going down Gannon Avenue or even Water Plant Road, you can see the kudzu is really taking over. So we're always going to have to treat our boundary line to keep it from coming back. Well, the reason I asked that, uh, she was probably, and I'm guessing 10 years ago, maybe more than that, we did eradicate the mm -hmm. kudzu and it came back and the complaint that drove that at that time was from dr wong who had the adjacent property and he accused us of coming off of our property on the hills which was probably true uh so i just uh history says we're still going to have to deal with it so. oh yeah absolutely as long as it's in the area it's something we're going to have to continually maintain so that it doesn't get to the state that it is now. Okay, so what about this? I'm looking at you, Joe. We do the herbicide, but then we maintain with our herd of goats. I mean, anything's... Awesome. I'm writing that down. Yeah, we can... <laughs> Sheila said yes to my herd of goats. Um, so I, I've... We've talked about the goats and the kudzu at Little River before. So like I said, I'm always happy to look into anything. I've had conversations with some of my colleagues that have used goats. So, I mean, it's really one way or the other. Um, depends on the area, what your intended uses are, how quickly you're trying to turn it over and make it an active space where people are going to be. But just for a maintenance issue, we might be able to, to do something else besides yeah. continually go back in with an herbicide. Yeah, I think there's areas probably in like the more natural state, like along mm -hmm. the wood line, uh, that it's something we can absolutely look into. Okay. Oh, and it would be helpful to mention, we did talk with the, um, our tree board and about this project and it was something that they supported, um, was moving forward with eradicating the kudzu. I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Um, how did that tie in with the tree board? Are there going to need to be trees that are removed as part of this because they're just too inundated with the kudzu? So we, because it was the urban forestry plan, um, and we are trying to, there's not a ton of opportunities right now to put information in front of our tree board. So it's not that it was related to trees coming and going, but we wanted an opportunity to work with the tree board in the capacity of an urban forestry plan to move forward. So gotcha. that was something they supported. Gotcha. Um, something, so you had uh, someone come before you uh, uh, several months back, I'm not quite sure, I believe it was the fall of last year, and I think it was something the mayor um, and some others have talked about as well, but uh, you were asked if you would support doing a whitewater park feasibility study. Um, I uh, took a look at that process. I talked with the consultant that they recommended, um, as well as some others. I've also talked with the city of Raleigh Park Planner. Um, they've been working on the Falls Whitewater um, project since the 70s. Um, and the project just for a Whitewater Park, but the, the costs are just astronomical. Um, and the city of Raleigh has been working on that for a long time. It was made to be a priority, but they bid it out just for the designs and the costs were far more exorbitant than they anticipated. And if just the design costs are that much more, they are starting to realize that the cost of constructing it. So they've even gone away from that white water park and they're focusing more on a um, river park concept. So um, in looking through all of that and talking with the different consultants and specifically looking at the rate of water flow at Little River Park, it is not my recommendation that you spend money to do a Whitewater Park feasibility study because based on the rate of flow and the water that is there, um, more than likely what's going to come back from your consultant is going to be a water or a river park, something that we would recommend through our master plan process. So, um, I mean, if, if that's something you still want to look into, just please advise us, but it's not my recommendation that we do that. Yes, sir. 
Any discussions with them about canoes or kayaks, making it a recreational area? Yeah, so that's what we would look at. Um, that, that's going to be um, multifold. So that's part of that bigger corridor district um, that you'll need, but that would absolutely be a recommendation that would come out of a water play um, concept and that river park concept. Uh, I don't have a, well, I might have a statistic in front of me, but I want to say the consultant that I talked with that, um, uh, was it Elizabeth Gardner, uh, came in. He said only 70% of the people that go to a, a park related facility, um, or not, 70% of the people don't even get in the water. Um, but his recommendation would absolutely be things like um, tubing, kayaking, canoeing, fishing, you know, that type of play, water play for the park. Any other questions? Um, community park, so we have an item, it was originally in our, we started it this past year in our operating budget. Um, but because it is something that is a recurring expense every four to six years, um, we are transitioning it to a CIP project. Um, so we're, we've been, we started an infill rehab rotation schedule. So uh, our infill should be great, laser graded and um, leveled out uh, every four to six years. And that is really gonna be dependent upon play and just wear and tear. Uh, if you go from the four year to the six year. Uh, right now you have four ball fields, so we think it's just wise to go ahead and plan for your field rotation one every year. Just start your program that way. It's something we can manage. And then, um, you know, if we find in that fourth year that it's okay, then we can just hold off and wait another year. But it's our recommendation that we at least put them on a schedule um, to just establish that maintenance standard so that it doesn't catch up on us. And then you've gone, like what we ran into at the field rehab we did this past year, is that we, it went so long with having that field rehab that the grass had grown in the, from the outfield into the infield about 30 feet. And it cost us a lot more money than we anticipated. Uh, so we want to do a better job of keeping our infields and our outfields um, maintained. Is that $10,000 the initial rehab and then it will just be a more maintenance and so a lower price in following years once we get the first, you know, that first round of four years under yeah, control? Yeah, so that's our hope, that because our fields, um, I mean, our fields aren't in terrible shape, but because they had not been, the infields had not been maintained, on a continuous schedule, they required a lot more work. And, and we, we've just done one, right? Okay. Yeah. So there's technically just three more that would need to be done and mm -hmm. then putting on maintenance. And then you start back. Okay. Um, so our hope is that we'll be able, um, now that we've started this process, but we won't really, I mean, as the amount of play increases on them, there'll be more wear and tear. So it's really hard to say that in four years, I mean, our population is going to be a lot different. Hopefully we have the play on that field and, um, I, I honestly hope that we do have the problem. But so, and looking, when we just look back into what you were talking about earlier, at some point you're hoping that there will be, on page 25, um, four fields. So we would have a total of six fields that would need to be maintained on that rotational schedule? Yeah. Yes, uh, unless you, unless you know, we decide moving forward that we want to deactivate one of those fields or two of those fields and give them another purpose, or make it more of a practice field and less of a playing field. I mean, it just depends okay. on, and that'll change the amount of play that's on that field and how often it'll have to to be maintained and the level at which you maintain it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is just community park, not the. Uh... The one we're recommending is at Community Park, and then we'll move to ZES for years three and four. Will um, our recreation fees um, help offset some of this? As in the, um, when we adopt an impact fee? Yes. Um, so, uh, yes and no. So an impact fee will be able to help us build additional facilities. An impact fee is not going to let us ma do maintenance on an existing facility. 
So uh, we'd be able to renovate, um, like if we were gonna change, I'm gonna use the example of the lower field at ZES. I mean, it's in a, the drainage is an issue. It's very wet. Um, if you look at it, it's just kind of, it's got the same problem as the basketball court at Gill Street. It's just in a bowl. Um, so is that the best use of that in the long term? You might change that to meet a need that's identified. Maybe it's volleyball courts. Maybe it's a wiffle ball court. I, I don't know. It, it could be something else. Uh, so what we've done is um, worked with Joe and as more of this master plan process moved along um, from when I originally submitted a um, budget request, I, I didn't have much to go on yet. Uh, but uh, in discussion with Joe, we're recommending $150,000 uh, for master plan implementation. And we're being vague uh, in this area on purpose because we want you to have the opportunity to review the master plan, adopt the master plan, and kind of give us some guidance on which one of these um, projects is a priority and the phasing because we're going to present it to you in a way as a small town, it's most likely that we would accomplish more by approaching it in a phasing capacity as we plan. And then as we get grant opportunities, we can consolidate some of those phases. So at least we have a plan we can do it ourselves if we had to, but we're gonna be looking for those grant funding uh, to help us move it along. So we are uh, gonna discuss and adopt a, a plan. We'll focus on achievable projects within uh, the year. We want to demonstrate movement to the community. Just projects that I pulled out that might be possible for 2022. Um, you're going to be moving forward with a branding um, process next year. And so part of that is branding all of our parks to match the town's brand. Uh, right now, all of our parks have different signage. Our system doesn't have a, a brand in itself. And so we want to, our brand will be the town's brand. And we can establish that to pull the community together and get them bought into um, our town from a recreational perspective. Um, also, we can use it to work on grant development, seeking other match funds or to match other funds. Uh, we can work on it from project design. Maybe there's something that stands out to you that we need to put it out for design, um, as well as advancing you know, projects that are in out years that you think are gonna be important to move forward. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, going back to low-hanging fruit projects, um, under, I guess, um, cultural opportunities, mm -hmm. um, I noticed in that City Vision uh, conference that we had, it was a proposal to just allocate uh, open spaces for something something like uh, a Dr. Martin Luther King garden mm -hmm. um, and it it could be at a park it could be at an alleyway it could be in an open space um, something um, that would probably uh, some nonprofits would be more than happy to be involved mm -hmm. churches um, I know Shepherd Alumni Association would probably um, want to be involved something of that nature, maybe at Gill Street Park or? Yeah, I think that you bring up a wonderful idea and a wonderful concept. And um, as we move forward and we talk about these projects, if there's something in particular that stands out to you, um, you know, if y'all could just provide us guidance and um, maybe what projects, if you want to dedicate a project to someone or something, um, help us with that um, to identify what those are and who and what. Um, and we can work with uh, different funding agencies to try and help secure that. Um, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, something similar to the um, Blue Star mm -hmm. um, space that we have out front. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thanks, Sheila. Thank you. 
Okay, your final formal presentation tonight is on the market study. The market study is not in this budget ordinance that's before you, so why are we talking about tonight? Because I believe we're gonna be at a point mid-budget year where we're gonna be in a position to bring back to you some options. So we wanna at least talk to you about some things that could come before you mid-year. I'm also sharing it with you because um, the, the staff, I think, um, I think, needs to hear that this is moving forward. It's not being slow walked. It, um, it's not being brushed under the rug. It's just, it's a very complex process. And so I'll explain what that means in a minute. So we kicked off a comprehensive pay and classification study in this fiscal year uh, for more robust organizations, meaning bigger and those that are competing uh, regionally and nationally for talent. They do this every year, but even for smaller organizations like uh, Wendell or Rollsville, this is something uh, where you're wanting to check in every four years. Uh, above and beyond that being good practice, this is something that I've been um, wondering about, given what I've told you before, and I'll tell you again tonight about this uh, period of time where we did more with less. So we hired a consultant. We hired them through the Triangle J Council of Governments. Questionnaires were completed by all the employees. So what does that mean? The employees filled out what was their job duties, and then the consultants compared those job duties with other jobs in our region just to make sure that the jobs were matching up with other jobs in other municipalities. All the employees had uh, an option to talk with the consultant. Salaries for those uh, like type positions were compared and evaluated throughout the region and the results were shared with the management team. Now those results, it was an answer to an equation that I don't really think uh, addresses the problem or the issues that we have here at the town of Zebulon. It's a simple approach. We could throw money at it, but it would just be resulting in throwing money. And so I wanted to spend some time with you to break down how complex the issue is. So the market adjustments, it affects each department differently. So the market is causing some recruitment issues in some department. It's causing some turnover issues in other departments. In some departments, they, they won the lotto, so to speak, and it's causing both recruitment and turnover issues. Mm -hmm. um, it is preventing us from progressing our employees in the development of their career, and as a result, it is hindering us in developing our succession planning for our future leaders in this organization. So there's no one size fits all. So it can't be, you can't just throw money at it. You gotta really understand what are all the different problems and how to solve it. So why is there uh, no one size that fits all? Well, it goes back to that we did more with less. So once again, this blue line, think of that as a pie. So from 2009 to 2010, the pie got a little bit bigger. And then from 2010 to 2013, that pie continued to shrink. That pie is the property tax revenue or our, and our revenue in general, but in this case, it's our property tax revenue. This um, line, that re represents the slice of the pie. So from 2009 to 2010, we shrunk the slice of the pie. So the, uh, and then from 2010 to 2011, the pie shrunk and we kept the, the smaller pie, or uh, slice of pie smaller. So financially, what was the result of that? From 2010, or in 2010, we had an 84,000 aggregate gain. While that might appear to be a lot for an organization that runs on a 12 to $14 million budget, that's not a lot of money. Um, that's the equivalent of outfitting a senior firefighter, uh, just salary, benefits, and equipment or giving everyone in the organization a 3% uh, option for 3% merit increase. Um, that's also assuming that no other costs, whether it be material, fuel, uh, maintenance, anything is going up. So very limited on what you can do with $84,000 coming in. 2011, we went into the hole 138,000. 2012, on top of the 138,000, we went an another 149,000. And 2013, even though the tax rate was increased, we went in the hole an additional 17,000. And so we not only did more with less, we were a very siloed organization, so we did it independently. We all addressed these shortcomings in different ways. 
So as I'm repeating to you, when you have a recession, similar to what we're uh, going through right now, the pie is shrinking. And so you either raise taxes or you get a bigger slice of pie. You cut the services. Now this, is, uh, this can be an area where organizations can get into trouble. You don't marginalize the service. So as an example, a cut in service is you close the community center and the employees that work at the community center go home. You don't, as an example, marginalize the service, whereas you say something like, well, it'd be nice to have four firefighters respond to a fire. This time, we'll just send three. You have to send four as a minimum. The other option is you borrow against savings. So when you borrow against savings, you've got to be very careful that if you're borrowing against savings, you've got to get a sense of how quickly and where you're going to replenish that money. And because I always get asked, you can make it up through efficiencies, yes, but those are marginal improvements. They take a long time to accumulate, and they um, often require a, a capital expense at the beginning. So I'm not going to repeat this. You've heard this before. You've heard it even tonight. We stopped investing in fleet. We stopped investing in street. And while it is, um, can be a heartfelt approach to ad address salaries first, if you don't fix the infrastructure, that is the whole that you keep digging on. That's where the bleeding continues. So you have to, if you're in a hole, you gotta stop digging. Um, and so I'm feeling better about the position where we are. We've got dedicated funding streams for our fleet. We've got dedicated funding streams for our street. Uh, as an example, we're starting to see our, our fleet turnover improve. And as a result of that, our maintenance costs are going down. We're also starting to see our pavement condition rating improve as well. So I think we're closing up that hole. We still have plenty of work to do in stormwater, as you've heard before, but we're doing better on the infrastructure side. So we're in a better position to start addressing the operational needs. So I will tell you tonight on where we are, and this is just, this is just one department story. We're starting to work on another department, and we've got other departments and other classes of positions throughout the organization that we need to look at. So first of all, we'll take a look at what is going on in the fire department. So this is the fire department's labor shed. And so that is an indication of where people are coming from when they apply for a position with our fire department, as well as uh, those that are hired. So I, I will use this pointer right here. But the significant thing here is we are, our labor shed, where we're getting people is from the east of us and the south of us. So that's really where our target area is. And that factors into a story that I'll tell you tonight. So uh, this is the turnover that we've seen. And we've showed you some comparison there with some other departments. They're bigger departments. Um, and so I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to compare us with a bigger department. But the story I'm trying to say is you see the great fluctuations in year after year and how we're going up and down, and we're not able to keep a, a, a smooth turnover ratio for a small department um, that has very big operational impacts. So that's the uh, point that I wanted to share with this slide. This is the slide that I really want to focus on. This gets back to that labor shed. So when we have exit interviews with our employees on why they're leaving, they list a, a multitude of reasons. They're looking for more money, or they've got uh, medical issues that they need to address. They're looking for a larger department. They're looking to get closer to home. Some of those things are going to be completely out of our control. Some of those things we don't want to be in our control. So as an example, when you look at um, more money, if someone is just that motivated by money, then they need to move on, okay? We're, we're not gonna necessarily be able to compete. But if they are looking to make more money because they're having to work two jobs, as opposed to going to a place where they can just work one job and spend more time with their family or just have more quality of life, that's something that we may wanna consider. And we have lost employees who have sought that. This larger department is another nuanced one that I want to expand upon. So larger departments, yes, they offer opportunity uh, for um, pay increases. They, offer, they also offer a chance for specialization. So if you are someone who's interested in swift water rescue and that's all you want to do, or you want to drive the tiller truck in, uh, through the streets of downtown Raleigh, then you're going to need to go to Raleigh, OK? Yes. Of the uh, turnover of, what, 11 people in the last four years, are there any retirements in here, or have they been excluded from the turnover? I'm 
checking the audience. We might have to get back to you. We'll have to get back to you, I think. <laughs> So, See, I, I know I can think of one myself. And that's, I, and I don't think that was the case. I don't think we included them, but I'm not 100% sure. Because um, I did not do this. Yeah, and then what is the fire department employment base number? Okay, so we've got four a shift. We've got three shifts, and that's the, that's our response as far as our response wing. Uh, and then we have admin staff. So we've got uh, chief, deputy chief, and fire inspector. I just shy of 20. Yep. We supplement that obviously with volunteers. And, uh, but anyway, we can get back to you on the retirement number. My, my assessment is what Lisa shared with you is that I'm only remembering one retirement, but we'll, we'll uh, clarify that. Um, and, and I apologize if I'm going through this. Stop, stop me if I start rolling along. So anyway, we were talking about larger department. So there's some things that we're not going to be able to uh, control. There are some things that we can at least mitigate. Sometimes um, these employees are leaving for a larger department because they have opportunities to progress. And so there are things that we can do from a career progression standpoint where we can augment and we can challenge and give greater responsibility for our employees. Now, ultimately, if they, they continue to grow and there's just not a, an elevated position for them, then they might need to go to a larger department. But the thing that I wanted to focus on tonight is that closer to home. So um, you will see, you saw in the labor shed where we're, we're pulling a lot of people from the east of us and the south of us. And to the east of us and the south of us, we're pretty competitive. Um, but people are driving a long way. And as Chief Perry has said before, sometimes the new wears off. And so I'll, uh, I knew I was going to do this. I was going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Put this aside. Use this. Um, so there is a cost of high turnover. Quantitatively, here are some examples. Every time someone turn, uh, turns over, it's not something where we can go, hey, you know, this is what so-and-so was wearing and maybe it'll fit you. Uh, same thing with uniforms. Qualitatively, it has a much bigger impact and there's a quantitative part to the qualitative, but I just talk about it generally. If we're spending so much of our time in recruiting, that's time that we're not taking in developing our employees. If we're always in that recruitment game, as a result of that, our shifts are limited in their basic orientation and training. If every time they're having to bring someone new into the shift, and then that shift has to get down to basics to, to reorient, they're not challenging themselves. They're not, they're not um, bringing on higher skills that they need to take on. So as a result of that, it minimizes the gain, gained experience of everyone and minimizes our potential for succession planning. Our fire recruitment um, over time and the number of candidates that we have been pulling in has been declining over time. So it's not just a turnover, but our applicant pool in both quantity and quality is decreasing. Um, you'll see in these, in these different uh, time frames the hires that we were able to pull from these applicant pools I think the one thing that I think is telling is this uh, highlighted note right here that, and this is, this is typical, when you're not really sure what is going on, you tend to respond to symptoms. And the, the symptom, and I don't think it was a bad move because I, I think it allowed us to pull in more um, applicants. But when you're starting to run short on applicants, you start thinking, oh, well, we'll just change the minimum age for, from 21 to 19. That is addressing a symptom, but also that is introducing something into the department, and we're also seeing this in our police department as we're starting to look into this, as you get a younger staff, a less seasoned staff, they don't have that mentorship, they don't have that uh, years of experience. And then just final note, out of the 14 hires represented since August of 23, only six ever have remained employed by the town of Zebulon. And, and once again, Commissioner Lox will get you a clarification of 
any of those were retirement. Okay, so this is, this is a comparison of the starting salaries of fire departments within Wake County. And as you can see, we are the lowest starting salary in Wake County. So as a result, and you saw this in the labor shed, we're pulling more employees from outside of Wake County. And that's good that we're competitive to the east and south of us. But as we see with uh, when people leave us, is they're having, if they're having to travel long distances after a while, again, the new wears off. So one of the things that we are considering, and we're just in the beginning phases of this, and this is just in the fire department, we've got to move on to police and planning, as well as some um, um, issues with the management level as well as other departments. If we look to become more competitive with the starting salary, as an example of moving it from 37.8 to 40,100, it's not that we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. We're trying to become more attracted to potential applicants, trying to reduce the likelihood of personnel leaving for more money, what, whatever that is. Uh, we're looking to reduce the time of, that we're spending recruiting and training new employees and as a result of that, we're trying to allow staff to become more experienced and seasoned and prepare for staff succession. Now, when we do that, when we, if we increase the starting salary of those entry-level firefighters, it has a domino effect all the way through the organization. So the kids in line, we can't elevate a starting uh, pay salary and have them above or very near one of their supervisors. So we're calculating what type of a financial impact this has on the kids in line. And so what's next, we'll start to work on the police department. Uh, we'll bring you something at your August work session on that. Uh, we're having turnover issue and planning. Management team, we've got some very long tenured members of our management team and some new hires that are, are out of balance with each other. And we've got to go through what we've just shown you with the fire department, with all departments. Again, this is not something that's in your budget ordinance, but we expect to be in a position where we come back to you mid-year, and so we wanted to give you some information on that. Um, and also, I wanted to demonstrate to staff that we are more working on this, but it's complex. That completes the market study presentation. Uh, just a quick question, and I know you're coming back, you know, later, but. If Wake County is 38,543, I'm assuming that would be like Wendell, uh, Hopkins, that sort of thing. I'm getting the yes on. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So is Wake County on board with helping us fund higher positions? Because they're paying now, it's gone what, down to 40%? Yeah. And I'm just curious how they feel about us upping it, which, look, I understand the purpose and the reason I'm, I'm not arguing that. I'm just wondering what their participation level might be with that. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer one that's more definite and one that's theoretical. Uh, the one that's more definite is when your, the amount of the budget in your fire department goes up, proportionally they have to pay more. Contractually, they're required to do that. Um, going above and beyond that, and one of the reasons why we are bringing to you a fire contract with Wake County that only has a one-year extension is we are working with them, as well as other municipalities are working with them, is what is the value of that, um, of that participation. So they will pay more. When our budget goes up, they have to proportionally pay more per their contract. We're having a discussion with them that we'll bring before you on is that compensation adequate or does their percentage need to increase? Are they looking at increasing their people? I don't know that. You wanna, you wanna talk about it? Mayor, make sure I understood, you understood your question. You said, were they looking to raise their salary? Was that your question? Or Are they looking to raise the salaries of the county department? Yes, yeah, so theirs is on a scheduled basis where it's reevaluated. It's either every four or every eight years, and I believe that is next year, that their salary will be, will be readjusted um, to put it more, as, as we've heard the term tonight, back more aligning with the market. Um, they do have a little more flexibility. What, what 
was indicated on their slide is their base. So someone that comes in with a couple years experience or something, they can add to that to pay them. But the, what you saw elevated at 38 number was their base salary, but I expect that to go up next year. I had understood that they had in this current year agreed to pay half of three new people down here. Is that correct? Half of three new people for us? Yeah. yeah we, we have a, the only um, the p personnel expansions that you'll see within this budget are to continue the floater position that was uh, originated within this fiscal year. They've agreed to pay their, their proportionate share as is outlined by the agreement. Um, so that is, that's the only expansion of personnel that we have within our budget. Okay, well I was told wrong, but sure. that's what I heard. And, and, I, and I'll add one other thing to the, to the conversation. Um, I can tell you that Garner is doing something very similar to what we are under. Um, and they basically, as part of their budget package, showed the impact that would do to their budget and the county has agreed to fund that so, you know, can I look into the crystal ball and say, yes, definitely, they are contractually bound, but we're seeing that in other departments that are going to do some of the same thing, that they've had to make adjustments and pay for their proportionate share of those raises that go along with those personnel. But that's up for review in one year. That contract is up for review. Um, Garner's not under a municipal contract. No, I said ours. Yeah, so we're, we're extending our contract for one year. That's correct. But even under the current one and, and the future, that they would be obligated. Oh, I understand. I'm just saying it could be renegotiated at that point. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Yeah, Joe, oh. yeah, another HR question. Okay. It's very wise to always interview an employee why they leave um, to understand why the turnover. Do we do anything? If we offer a position to a fireman and he doesn't accept it, as into why, because he initially applied here, may have made the cut, but we offer the job and they don't take it, do we inquire why they turn it down? I don't believe we do. I mean, I think the first part of your question is do we do exit interviews? Yeah, and th and those you do. Yeah. Uh, but do we, do we follow up on why did they turn it down? I, I would say no. We, we could, I, I'll check and clarify that, but I feel confident we don't. Do we have any kind of um, incentive programs for, uh, in the uh, hiring process? We don't. Um, our recruitment, um, I guess, area, just how, is it, is it statewide or nationwide or global? As far as our recruitments in Fire, as an example? Yes, applications. Yeah, it, it's exactly what you saw on that graph. So it's it's pretty much set East Central North Carolina. Other questions? So you're saying somebody won't drive from Asheville to go to work and then drive back <laughs> or, or move. Uh, I get it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Because I need to and nobody's here, I'll ask if there's anyone, any public input or someone that wants to speak. And seeing none, uh, I'll ask for more questions or comments from the board. And... Hearing none, I'll ask for manager for report. Yeah, I, I don't know why it's on here. <laughs> uh, we will um, we'll, we'll bring you forward the budget ordinance that's in your packet. That is what will be presented to you on at your regular board meeting. Okay. I apologize. I, I did have one one question, and it probably goes back. Uh, I was I was looking in the budget where we we're. Uh, maintaining the same um, uh, fee for um, for our um, uh, cemetery. Plots, um, and I don't know if they're this, are they lower than our local cemetery plots or are they the same? 
I'm going to let Bobby answer that. Okay. And Bobby can share with you um, some information about the capacity remaining in the cemetery as well. Yes, um, I've told some people this before. I've been here 25 years. Chris has been here longer uh, and when he was selling them. Um, and to my recollection, it's been the same since the whole time. Um, it has not went up. Uh, it is, I think, significantly less than a lot of places. Definitely private. Uh, I don't know right offhand other municipal cemeteries, what they are in comparison. Um, um, oh, what Joe was saying. Yeah, the capacity is, uh, we're about out of capacity out there. Um, there are some plots available, but they might have a huge tree sitting in the middle of them or roots growing out into the open ones and uh, making them unusable. I know some, some cemeteries are also um, offering like a two for one. Uh, hat half price and just dig one a little deeper and then put another one on top for a half price. I don't know if that would uh, help our sales or well, if anybody's interested um, in. You may remember, I think about two years ago, we amended the uh, cemetery ordinance to allow for cremation. That's becoming more popular. Um, Cause before it basically said one, uh, we could explore the possibility of what you're saying, one on top of each other. Um, but used to, it used to be like one per plot, okay, mm -hmm. uh, vault, burial. Um, then we changed it where you can put two cremated remains in a plot to kind of, you know, allow more capacity without you know, expanding, expanding. Um, and, you know, also there's some part out there, a handful of plots that have rock on them. Uh, where you definitely couldn't go one on top of the other because you can you can't even get deep enough to get one. Um, does that? I mean, we could explore that possibility. Yeah. Uh, for some, um, are you interested in hearing comparisons on these? Yeah. From others? Okay. Right. We can do that. Let me add that some years ago, we were selling those plots for fifty dollars a piece. And the idea was it was for, you know, local people. And, but what happened was that speculators came in and started buying them so that they could turn around and, and sell them at a higher price. And for that reason, we raised the cost. Now, I don't think we've revisited since then. This has been a right good while back. Um, my point being is there's probably still some speculative lots out there. Uh, I don't know how you would ferret them out. But my belief is there probably are some there that people bought simply to make money on by reselling. Mm -hmm. But this isn't really making a big difference in the bottom line to what we have to work with no. budget-wise. No, it's, it's a minuscule okay. yes. problem. And, you know, and he's right, we're running out of space. So at some point, my opinion is the town's having to be out of the cemetery business, except for the fact that it's not really supposed to be perpetual care, but it is. I mean, our people go over and take care of it. So, yeah. Uh, I think to the tune of, I uh, can't remember what the number is, was 30, 40,000 a year. Um, we're contracting it out, uh, starting here. And yeah, so it's definitely what we sell is on average maybe about 10,000 a year in revenue for sales, and that's drying up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it does, definitely does not cover any, and there's no other maintenance fees that we charge. So it's definitely not a profit. No, I, I realize that that was my, my point, that in theory, everybody's supposed to clean up their own spot, but it doesn't happen. Right. And it's, not, it's never going to happen because family passes away. There's nobody to look after them or care about them. And a majority of well, if you go out there, a lot of them don't even have family here. I mean, Willie B. Hopkins, I went out there one day, and his he had a, a fire ant hill halfway up his monument. Mm. I mean, you know, they don't have family around. That, that was my point. You know, yeah. there's nobody to take care of. 
I'm not saying we shouldn't do what we're doing. Don't misunderstand no, me. No, I, I understand you know. that. Um, how many, uh, possibly how many plots do we have left that are usable? Not yeah, anything that you've got to miss with granite and any of that. Yeah, it's probably in the 10 to 20 range. 10 to 20. In what? 10 to 20. He's at 20. Probably more like 10. Um, unless we do anything about removing some trees or something. We might need to explore that because uh, we may need to get somebody out there to look and see if some of them are not healthy or they can be removed without. I mean, there, there's some large trees out there. It would not be cheap to remove them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I understand. So really, this is just costing us money to maintain it every year, and we're not going to be seeing anything in the future that's going to change that, we're probably just going to be seeing an increase of costs. Correct. And so we might need to start considering what our options are to kind of get ourselves out of the cemetery business. Well, I'll give you my opinion that, yeah, at some point we're gonna be out of the cemetery business because we don't have the plots and I don't see it. But it's still anything. gonna to have to be maintained unless we figure out another option, right? Well. Yep. Well, what I was going to say is that the, they were never sold at a value for perpetual care like Gethsemane. Right. And there's nothing we can do about it. I think we're just going to have to eat it. And for years, we'll have to go out there and still mow it. I don't think we can let it go because I don't know how you could sell it to someone that they could make it profitable to go over there and maintain it. It's just not going to happen. Hey, Joe. Goats. <laughs> okay. Thank anyway, you. that's my opinion. Ken. Thank you. So, all right, thanks. Goats. Anything else, Joe? No, sir. All right. Motion to adjourn. Motion. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs>